entitled to precious. Uh, <laughs> and truthfully, I don't know how you get through some of these songs that you do. Uh, I could have done that. Now I have to see what I can get through. What I got to do is now think about my mom. <laughs> That was powerful. Turn with me to John. Chapter 17. Let's look at these verses. You guys have your bulletins? What's the title of this sermon? Jesus. Does that make any sense to you? Jesus' single concept. John chapter 17 records a prayer that Jesus gives. And do you realize that in this prayer, he is praying for you here today? And this is why I picked these verses, because in his day, he's not praying for just his disciples, but he's praying for those who will come after them, who will believe on his name, and that is you and I today. And let's look at what he prays for. Matthew 17, start at verse 20. I do not pray for these alone. He's talking about his disciples and those who are following him. But also for those who will believe in me through their word. That is you and I today. That they all may be what? Let me ask you a question. In the life of Jesus... What's the context that this prayer is coming from? What's going on in his life? Why is he praying this prayer now? Any ideas? He prayed for me. He prayed for me. Okay. His death is imminent and it is at hand. Now, if you knew you were going to die in a couple of hours or a day, what would be your thoughts? What would you want to take care of before they came? and took you away and you couldn't take care of anything. What do you love? Okay. So do you think you would be able to narrow down every responsibility you have and you would have clarity of thought of what would be the most important things? Now I want you to think about this because this is where Jesus is at in his earthly life. He has come down to the end and this life is about to be taken from him or he'll give it up. And what is he thinking about? What are his final thoughts? His thoughts are you. Now, he prays for specific things. And let's look at some of those things that he's praying for. What's the first thing he prayed? He prayed that you guys may be what? One. One. What does that mean? What kind of oneness was he talking about? One accord? What does that mean? Okay, so the oneness has to be based in Him, on Him, and through Him. Is that right? So when Jesus prayed that His church would be one, did He mean that everybody would think alike? No. That everybody would act alike? And that everybody would have the same view of Scripture and the same opinion? One purpose from one power. Okay. What does that mean? It means we're all united. We think differently, but we have different parts that we play. But we're all moving like in the same direction. I like that. And what direction is that, right? A perfectly oiled machine towards Jesus. I like it. So let's, is there room for diversity in Jesus' church? Amen. There better be because Jesus made us all different. Is there room in Christ's church for differences of opinion? Absolutely. There has to be. Because none of us is going to come to the same opinion when we see one thing. Hey, if you can't agree on the color of your carpet or pews, <laughs> then how do you expect to agree on deeper theological issues? What then will unite us and what will make us one? Faith. Faith? Faith in what? Christ. There you go. See, 
What will make you one? And this is what you have to know, <coughs> live, breathe, and act is what makes you one is not faith. It is Jesus. I can have faith that my pilot is going to get me from this airport to that airport, and I can be wrong. We may not make it. Or I can be right, he may make it. Okay? I can have faith that my automobile is going to start when I know that I left the lights on before the church. Okay? But I got faith it's going to start. It may not start. Okay? We can have faith in a lot of things. What will bind you, what will unite you, and what will keep you together is that you know Christ as well as you know your spouse, your children, your brothers, your sisters, your best friends. Christ has to be real. He has to be as real to you today in your life as I am standing here talking to you. And this is one of the problems within Christianity today. We speak of Christ, we read of Christ, but we do not know who Jesus is. Amen. Jesus Amen. is an ethereal thing that's just out there. We talk about him, but he's not real. Let me ask you a question. How many hours a day does God give you? 24. 24. Everybody has the same, right? Nobody has 25. You all get 24. And in that 24 hours, you got to sleep, right? So let's say between 5 and 8 hours, some people need 10 or 12. So it leaves you about 15 or 16 hours of your day, right? You're going to work 8, 9, 10 hours. During that time when you're awake and you're interacting with people, does Jesus really become real to you? Is He influencing your conversations, your decisions? Is he even in the forefront of your mind as you're going through your day? That wasn't a rhetorical question. I'm waiting for some answers. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, this is what is going to make you one. This is what's going to unite this church and get you from a surface level unity, which is where we're at today. Amen. Surface level. We're united on Saturday for one and a half hours. And then when we go home, we're done. Not all of us, but the majority of us. When you leave here, how much thought do you give to the people sitting next to you throughout your week? And you want to spend eternity with each other? Now, some of you are thinking, why did this man even come back? <laughs> There has been a burden on my heart for months and months and months, and I've seen the direction that this church has gone, and I wasn't really pleased or happy with it, and the only one that I can blame is myself. And we talk about love, we talk about unity, but we do not have that. And if you are sitting here thinking, sure we do, you have no idea what's going on within your church. Okay? It's surface, and we need to move from beyond a surface, shallow level of love and unity to what Christ really prayed for, what He gave His life for. The question is, is, that what you, is, is this what you want? Or are you happy with a surface, with a pretend unity? No. Do you know what the word hypocrite means? Another word for hypocrite in the Greek is the word actor. <coughs> Now, if I use the word hypocrite, that has bad connotations. But if I use the word actor, in our culture today, there's nothing bad about that at all. All that is is somebody playing a part. And I've got to ask you, when you come to church, are you just playing a part? And are you playing it for a couple of hours, and when you leave, you go back to who and what you really are? Right? Another word. I don't want to be that strong. Well, that's what you're saying. <laughs> Listen, so that I'm clear. I'm not calling us, and I'm included in this, liars. I don't even want to call us hypocrites. What I see is a church that is caring, that loves. But I see a deeper need here that we have to overcome. How many of you guys have been here for more than 10 years? Raise your hand. 
Raise them up high so people can see. Okay? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. How many of you have been here for more than 15 years? Raise your hand. One, two, three. Do you guys four? Do you guys remember when you had more people coming to church than what you have here today? Yep, Bob says yes. Do you remember when you had less people coming to the church than what you have today? I remember when I first came here to help Pastor Kurt out. And I had been here prior to that because I used to help Pastor Bob McMillan. Okay? And when Bob McMillan was here, there was a good amount of people that came to church. When Pastor Kurt was here when I came here, and when he left, there was like 19 people coming. Do you want to go back to those days? If you do not get over this surface uh, friendship, this surface unity, that's where you're headed. I've had five weeks to think about this. And like I said, I look and I go, where is the problem at here? And the problem has to start with leadership and, and, and I am the pastor. <laughs> One of the hardest things for us to do is actually trust people. I'm going to ask you a question, and I want you to answer it very honestly if you can. I want you to raise your hand if you are a naturally trusting person. Now I want you to raise your hand. You put it up. I want you to raise your hand if you trust everybody in this church. Look around. Okay, now you see, I haven't raised my hand, right, on either one of those, because I'm not a naturally trusting person. I've gone through years of training not to be a trusting person. Then when I came to learn and know God, I realized that everything that I learned wasn't for my benefit, but it actually hinders me. So, Ray, you're a trusting person? A guy comes up to you at the gas station and he wants money, what's the first thought in your head? My first thought is, uh, I, I guess it's two questions. Okay. You know, because I don't want to just, I, I see a lot of deception. Yes, but my, my intention is to trust. Okay. I do want to do that. And I try to weed out everything that's in the way. How do we live in this world today when? It's not safe to open your door when somebody knocks on it. You don't know who that is. It's not safe to not know what's going on in your surroundings when you go from the store to your car, if you're loading groceries in your car. It's not safe for your children to play out in the front yard without supervision. How do we continue to have our hearts softened and love people when we live in a kind of world that we live in today. Right? To be other centered, to continue even though you could get hurt. You know, Will Rogers once said that he'd rather be the fellow that bought the Brooklyn Bridge than that poor soul that sold it. That's, that's pretty much it. To be other centered, even though you could be hurt bad. That's called vulnerability, right? Yeah. You have to be vulnerable. The love we have. What I have experienced in my walk, what I see in the experience of the church, is that we have great head knowledge. Mm -hmm. And we have what we think is clarity of thought mm -hmm. and clarity of sight. And we're able to see, especially in others, their defects. But we are very bad at looking at our own. <laughs> and when we deal with people within the church, and we're supposed to be other-centered, we're great at seeing their defects. And if we're in leadership, we're quick to try to fix those defects. And we're not 
willing to see our own. One of the greatest things about having a spouse is that your spouse is really good at letting you know. She just says, why did I say it like that? Because she does. <laughs> Listen, it's wonderful. Ray and I are a lot alike in a lot of things. And if we didn't have somebody there to point those things out, we would go through this life telling other people what their problems were, never even realizing what our problem is. And then, don't care. But when you bring it to us, especially when you bring it to us in power, sometimes that's the only thing that gets us to open our eyes to see who and what we really are. Do we have any car salesmen here this morning? <laughs> Raise your hand, Gary. <laughs> I've upset people before. I've made people think because I've said there is a fine line between a car salesman and a pastor. Do you have any idea what it is I'm talking about? You have to believe in what you're selling. Yeah, but in the end, you're selling something, right? Yeah. And so, you have people today who claim to be talking for God when all they're doing is trying to enrich themselves or acquire more power. It has nothing to do with God. Okay? That's the world you live in today. A lot of hypocrites, a lot of actors. That's on the upper level of leadership in church. How do we as leaders not become just actors, playing a role or playing a game? Because if the leadership doesn't get this right, the membership never will. Leadership will set the tone for anything that happens within the church. Do you guys believe that? Yeah. Why do you think they get rid of pastors? Why do you think pastors only stay for a certain period of time? If they lose their influence, or if their influence is bad, the church has the moral obligation to make a change. If the leadership sees in the congregation that there is something bad, then the leadership has an obligation to make a change, right? Isn't that what Christ has called us for? Okay. So let's look at these verses. You realize this is going to be a two-part sermon. Because it's 12 o'clock already. I do not pray for those alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. That they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in what? Us. How do we become one? The only way you have more than a surface unity is that each and every person is united to the Father through the Son. Amen. The most important thing that you guys need to hear week after week after week after week is not more doctrine per se, but it is Jesus Christ. Um, pretty much everybody here knows the doctrine of the church. And it is true, it is based on scripture, but doctrine will do you no good at all if you do not know the author of the doctrine. Amen. Paul said that I can have all knowledge, being able to understand all mysteries and explain them. But if I have not love, it profits me what? Nothing. The love he was talking about. What kind of love? Was it phileo love? Eris love? Divine. Non-conditional. Agape love. Non-conditional, right? The love that comes from God. So when Paul says, if I have not love, he's not talking about an emotion. He's talking about Jesus Christ. Because the word says God is what? Love. If I have not love, it profits me nothing. If I do not have Christ living in me, it is worthless. All this that I do for him, or pretend to do for him, is meaningless. It means nothing. It will profit you nothing. 
and it will not bring glory to God. Why do I bring all this to you? Let's continue to read. That they all may be one, verse 21, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. How many of you here this morning believe that your Christian witness is important? Raise your hand. Look around, because it's the majority of the people here. Do you realize that your Christian witness is solely based on your unity with each other? Amen. You guys understand that? Amen. Because that's what Jesus said. That's how you'll know that they are my disciples. The love they have for one another. This is why I tell you that it's a surface love and that that doesn't work. Jesus tells you if you have a problem with your brother or your sister, what should you do? Talk to the pastor? Go to that brother and sister. Now, how many of you are honest enough to raise your hand to tell me that's what you do every time you have a problem with your brother and sister? Okay? I'm going to tell you that the majority of you do not do that, myself included. And you will go to somebody else before you ever talk to your brother. Most of you won't even want to talk to your brother. But you will have no problem talking to me about your brother. That is not what my calling is for. I am not here to listen to you talk about your brother or your sister. You need to talk to your brother. You need to talk to your sister if you have a problem with them. If you want this oneness that Christ is talking about, you need to go to that brother and sister. Because this is the law that Jesus laid down. You go to them first. If they do not listen to you, then you come to me. Or an elder. And then together we go to your brother or your sister. But first, you need to talk with them. You need to try to work this out. And if you can't work it out between you two, then you get the church involved. That's what I'm here for. Is after you try to reconcile with your brother and your sister. Now, how many of you guys like conflict? Raise your hand. I thrive on Thank you, Doc. Yes. Gotta keep you honest. I do. And what you find is that if you don't know me very well, you may think that I'm this nice guy that's here, but. If we have a conflict, you may see a whole different side of me that you never saw before, nor will you like. Amen. <laughs> you don't let it out of the bag. You never let it all out of the bag. Do we fight the flesh? Yes. No. And what is it that you fight? You fight all the experiences, all of the things you have learned, all of the sin that you have uh, strengthened, that you have fallen into and continue to allow to get stronger and stronger.